seem to change from, you know, you think you had it set one way and then it's not set that way. <laughs> the setting seems to have changed mysteriously and I don't know what caused them to change. So, but um, hi, Javier, I see you're there. I hope Mike Paddock will really join us, but if not, we have him and Steve Crow. We invited their comments and I know Steve from the country office in Guatemala wasn't planning to join the call, didn't indicate he was, but Paddock did say that he would. So if Mike joins us, that'll be helpful. Yeah, that'd be good. He's got experience on both sides and work with yeah. Javier on the CMU tanks in Honduras. Let me just, uh, in fact, I'll just, I'll just send him a text reminder that we're getting ready to start this thing. You know, he is the chief engineer for EWB and he's involved in this COVID tactical and he's online. response. And so they're uh, a little busy, so. He's, he's online, Pat. Oh, there he is, great. Well, Mike, thank you for joining us. I don't know if you can hear audio yet or not, but. Uh, nope, you guys are coming through loud and clear. Super. Hey, Mike, it's been a while. Nice to, nice to hear from you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, for those of you who don't recall, I think, let me refresh, see if I got this right. When, when the San Francisco professionals was really were, were really struggling with the Honduras team to find a structural mentor and structural talent, uh, and the project had gone through hiccups, uh, big rotary global grant funding from several, Rotarian, uh, several rotary clubs in the Salinas area, uh, finally, uh, they 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 uh, kind of were in a lull. They came back on the air and uh, and got a trip together. And then Mike was able to join us, join that trip, and Javier was able to join that trip. And they knocked out the tanks and got the system moved along. So we appreciate that kind of help. And uh, it it was a, it was an example of a number of lessons learned about that project. I mean, we ended up having San Francisco professionals. Um, uh, unable to apply for uh, headquarters uh, EWB grants for a year, I think at least one cycle because of failure to report on some grants, uh, grant funding and so forth. So at any rate, thanks again. And thank you for joining us, Mike. You guys want to, uh, I, the principles on this, Larry, you prepared the report, Phil, you commented on it. I commented on it a little bit. I think it's a great framework for us to go through. Uh, I thought that the, what, context on this, I think everybody knows it, but the reports are from the country office in Nicaragua that a lot of the plant plastic tanks that we were planning to use are experiencing what I would characterize as early, early in life cycle uh, failures. And they seem to be in a variety of modes. There are some pictures we've seen. Um, and so that's our baseline that we'll be submitting. But we said, hey, you know, it's a good opportunity with our Berkeley students and others to go through what a what a trade study looks like. And I don't know how many of them have participated, but I noticed Daniel, you're on board and uh, it's, uh, it's a powerful vehicle. I think I need to shut the door. Yeah. Uh, a day of Zoom calls and my wife reminding me she thought I was, we were eating before the Zoom call. <laughs> so, Oops. At any rate, so it goes. So, so it goes. And Mike, in a sidebar, when, as soon as you get a chance offline, if you can just shoot me and uh, Rod and Zola, the names of the, the folks who are working that Escantla Global Grant, uh, uh, so we can, we can get in touch with them and uh, get, find a little more info, that'd be great. You're muted again, Mike. I, maybe I can unmute you, but you I might got have it. to. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I'll send you a, a draft Global Grant in Word and then connect you to the leads. Well, Julio will be the lead from Vista Hermosa, and okay. then uh, Jerry Stefaniak from uh, Rotary Club of Milwaukee. But I'll get that out to you. I got, I got scrubbed on by a little bit from some person who didn't think that I could have just made that decision. And I said, no, we'll ratify it in our Area 4 Global Grant Committee. But uh, we're, we're, I said, to be clear, that committee is the decision maker on it, not you <laughs> who have some DDF in it. So <laughs> but it was one of those kind of conversations with some Rot Rotarians in our Area 4 crowd who don't really get how the committee works. It's a new incoming president-elect. With that, that's, that's some rotary business offline, uh, but it, it's engineers without borders and rotary trying to partner. <laughs> All right. So let's, what's the best way to rattle through this, uh, this trade study review and just make sure, well, I want to be sensitive to everybody's time. Uh, 
I think Mike's got a great perspective. Uh, he and Steve Crow were the ones who really s led us to the idea of the ferro uh, cement tanks. Um, Steve sent us a nice uh, example design package with a bill of materials that I think Larry used to, uh, as part of the basis for pre preparing the, the trade study. And then I think we had Javier had experience with the, uh, uh, the Honduras team's uh, uh, concrete tank. And then we have cost basis for the, the plastic tanks that are our current baseline. Well, I can start off um, going over quickly the requirements I gave Larry that we're looking at. And then I'll turn over to Larry to kind of walk through his, um, his charts. And I think it can go fairly quickly here. So the requirements, um, right now we have two tanks, 22,000 liters each. So we're looking for a total capacity of about 44,000 liters. We have a preferable um, feature that we can divide the storage system into two parts. So if we ever need to maintain part of it, we can take part of it down and still keep the other part working so we don't bring the whole system down. For example, in, in Honduras, the tanks they had had a partition in the middle of it. So you can operate each one separately if we needed to. Mm -hmm. um, Want to be able, capable of withstanding the seismic loads and wind loads on the top of the hill. A minimum 10 year life and preferable 20 year life or more. And another desirement that came out from Pat, and I think others have echoed that, is um, if we have a chance to, to teach a new technology that could be useful in the community, such as making ferro cement tanks, that could add a little bit of a, a push one way or the other if, if a couple choices are, are very close. Any questions on that? If not, um, Larry, I can turn it over to you. Do you want to share your screen or I can bring up the spreadsheet and share I it? I hope everybody has it. I actually, I, you want me to try to bring it up on my screen or? Yeah, it might make it easier to walk through if it's not. Uh, you know, actually, oh, I, I have to, you know, it might take me a little time. time well, but, Bill, Bill, can you bring it up or, you know, I, I don't have access to it right here, in, but I can get access. I mean, I know where it is. I can get it if you want me to do I, it. I could get it too, but actually I did it on a different computer and I don't. Uh, I have to go through my mail. <laughs> I had it up earlier today. Let me see if I still have it open here. If it's yeah, well, uh, let me just talk a little bit about it while you're getting it up. Yeah, yeah I just basically um, took the information I had, and it was very good information on both the uh, CMU tank and the uh, ferro cement tanks uh, that was provided to me. And I, I don't spend a lot of detail on the you know nitty gritty costs. I I try to get it in the ballpark and try because I think that's adequate for a trade study and they they, they didn't uh, work out the cost to, I don't think is our big Im impact in this case anyway and so um, so I I basically looked at the uh, different thing. yeah we'll start with that that one so I, this talks about uh, what Phil talked about the scope of the study where I looked at uh, three tanks uh, references were the ones provided by uh, Steve Crow and uh, Javier Andre. And then I, I did a little bit of uh, research to, uh, because of the failures in the poly tanks, I did a little research and I found a paper by Purdue University Extension that suggested uh, a level concrete pad when you get up to roughly the sizes that we were looking at. And then I also found uh, 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 U.S. manufacturer of polyethylene tanks who had some suggestions and interestingly enough one of his uh, reasons that they think that these tanks crack is because people uh, bring pipes in that are rigid from the side and they say when the tank is filled and uh, when the water is then taken out it expands and contracts and then puts stresses on the uh, side of the tank with, which kind of uh, conflicts would I think uh, Elizabeth Diaz got from the tank manufacturer who wanted rigid pipes going in from the side. So we almost have like a couple different opinions there, but the, that was one of, one of their suggestions is that you have some kind of a flexible a connection at the side with the, where the piping comes in because of the tank expansion and contraction. And, uh, you know, they also said, talked about the UV issue. Uh, and and so, so I in, try to include that to try to, try to, you know, from what I saw of the tanks that they had, they were having really early life failures. And so I made a or considered a couple of design improvements in what, how we would do it maybe to uh, improve that life. But I, but I don't know exactly where it ends up. I had, 
I guessed it would maybe make 12 years, but I, but you know that's that's a that's a shot in the dark. Um, what what it will really last, and then um, so I I just assume that the uh, reference one and reference three, which are the ferro cement and the CMU tanks, they would have acceptable seismic and wind loads once they were analyzed, um, and then they. Uh, I, both the information I got on the ferro cement tank and on the um, uh, CMU tank had uh, de detailed material cost estimates, and I went through there and looked for the for the major cost drivers, you know, which were, you know, CMU units, uh, the amount of steel that was in the in the construction, uh, the amount of cement, and you know, looked at those major cost drivers, and then us. Uh, compared those to uh, information that Phil had given me earlier on what we pay, had paid in Nicaragua, because I didn't know if the prices in Guatemala and in the Honduras would be exactly the same. And, and so I actually was able to adjust those somewhat uh, based on the numbers that uh, Phil had provided me earlier on, on what we spent in, in uh, Ilianito. And so, um, I took that took that information, and then the uh, the uh, ferro cement tank was pretty close in size. It it could to what we were looking. They have a twenty five thousand liter. We want twenty two thousand liter. Phil had suggested that maybe I could even make it a bigger tank and put a partition in. I was a little worried about uh, that situation because I haven't seen a lot of analysis of these type of tanks. So I kept it as uh, two separate ferro cement tanks. Uh, rather than trying to make it a single tank with a with a wall in the middle, uh, I, I just didn't want to push the technology because uh, I'm not mm -hmm. that familiar with it. And then um, the CMU tank, it was uh, pretty close again in size. Uh, we could take off. Uh, I figured one layer of CMU, one row of CMU uh, blocks, and then you know I reduced the steel and reduced the uh, number of CMU blocks for that, and then. Com Compared again the cost that they paid in the Honduras versus what we paid at El Yanito. and so uh, that's basically how I, I came up with the numbers. Uh, and you know some of the assumptions are is you know some of the uh, cement tanks are going to take uh, additional help from the caps members, and I've I've assumed that that's you know that's all free and, and that um, we we will. You know, basically, don't have to pay for that. Um, but I did assume that in the ferro cement tank that that you were going to have to have a uh, special masing there. But let's go with the the, the poly tank here, which he has. Uh, Phil had given me some numbers early on. I think roughly eleven thousand dollars. He figured to have the two tanks uh, delivered, including tax and transport to the site. Um, and so I kind of worked back from that and gave, you know, laid out prices for, you know, the tanks and, and uh, other stuff. And then I added in the concrete pad and, you know, added in some flexible connections to it and, and adding some paint. So it ends up being more like $12,000. Um, and, you know, I assume that your numbers are pretty good, Phil. I don't, I don't know exactly where you got them from, but. Uh, um, yeah, we had some earlier quotes from them and I asked, uh, escalated them for tax and, and added 10% for transportation on top of it, 15% tax. And I can't yeah. remember if I gave you a contingency on top of that or not, but I figure for the purposes of a trade study, it's probably close enough. Yeah, yeah. And so, so um, basically I had those tanks in there and then I uh, added in, you know, I guess we use a local mason uh, in El Yanito. And I, I think we pay them roughly $20 a day. Again, I don't know if that's correct. I I saw some numbers somewhere that we like gave. 400 them. bucks a month, I think we're paying them. Yeah, yeah, that's 20 some working days, so yeah, yeah. So um, so I put that price in there. Uh, one of the things is if this tank only lasts 12 years, you're gonna have to replace it at some point. And so I, add, I, saw, I just made a couple estimates, kind of a high and low estimate as to how much you really should be saving uh, in a savings account to be able to do this capital equipment replacement in 12 years. And those numbers kind of worked out, you know, on the low end, it's like $94 a month you should be saving. On the high end, you should be saving $141 a month. Uh, I think Phil said that those kind of numbers would uh, not sit well with the 
the local caps group, but uh, those, that's what yeah, that's what I calculated. If you want to replace it in 12 years, you got to start saving for it now. You don't want to you don't want mm -hmm. it to break and not have any money. So. Yeah, no, this is probably a good valid one for um, being aware of what the costs are going down, downstream. So that's that's good that you did that, Larry. Yeah. Okay. So you want to go on to the next the next one? Sure. And then. I mean, uh, I'm open to suggestions. I want to be sensitive to how you guys want to best think about this because I, I quickly skimmed over it. Thought it was a nice framework for being able to articulate why we, you know, when we finished this trade study, why we made the choices that we did. And to me, it's all about the weighting and scoring factors and so forth. But I thought this was just a, a perfect example. I don't know, Daniel, if you've had an opportunity at UC Berkeley to participate in many trade studies, but these are the bread and butter of, uh, of, of, of engineering in, in the world. So I can't say I've seen many in the past, but it's definitely interesting to look through. Yeah. I think it's really a useful tool. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. So here's the, uh, the cost for the, is this the ferrous, ferrous cement? I can't remember. CMU. Oh, this is a CMU. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And again, there's, there's a cost. I'm not going to go through them line by line. I don't know. Javier, uh, you might have some comments on these. I mean, these, uh, I basically used the information I got from you, but uh, uh, if you see anything that sticks out as uh, unreasonable, let me know. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah. And so again, uh, again, this one, I, I assumed uh, we need three weeks of the Mason's time. Uh, so there was some added costs for that. Um, and then the, the next item, yeah, that's a click on it. Takes a second to come up. There it goes. Okay, this is the Ferro Cement. Um, and uh, they had their total cost at, at like $3,100. And then I kind of looked at, again, uh, our tank is a little bit smaller. Just a little explanation there. That's a little smaller in diameter, but it's basically uh, goes from 2.3 meters in diameter to 2.16 meters. But it's basically, it's very similar, I think it would be in the design. And uh, and I looked at their material costs. I, I think the Guatemala project, I don't know when they, when they did that, um, but they had um, similar cement costs, but, but we ended up with higher um, steel costs in Nicaragua. So I adjusted it somewhat for, for that. Uh, it's not a very big adjustment. You can see one from 3,100 to 3,500, but, uh, mm -hmm. and, uh, Again, then I, to this you have to add some labor. Again, I have I put this expert mason in at fifty dollars a day. I don't know where we get him, and I don't know what his rate would be. But I just thought he'd be more expensive than the local mason. Yeah, if we end up picking this one, we need to talk about where we get this expertise in, and maybe yeah, Mike Paddock will help us. I don't know. If if what Steve suggested when he when he sent sent us this uh, was that this was pre. COVID-19 restrictions, but that he could either uh, provide uh, a, one of the skilled people he, he has that he works with uh, to instruct people, or perhaps even have them be present to assist in the construction of one of them. Uh, so we, we can work with Steve on that. He was, he's been very helpful to us uh, along the way here on other things. And, and he and the country office in, in Nicaragua uh, have a great rapport so we we can we can see what's the best way to get that talent and help in there maybe it's maybe it's whatsapp in the field maybe i don't know mike whether you've got some sense of of what might be practical there when we get if we get to that point i don't mean to prejudge the outcome i already did that <laughs> once <laughs> sorry <laughs> no I, uh, just, I, just a little bit of um for for the ferro cement honestly it's um it's a little bit more art than science um, so when you're placing the mortar up against the, uh, the sides, uh, it's really good to have someone there. I, I know that when we have taken this uh, technology to other parts of even Guatemala, we've always had one of the lead masons go there for, for two or three weeks. So uh, certainly it's easy enough to travel between Guatemala and Nicaragua on regular conditions. So I think that would be wise because we want to make sure that uh, if we're going to, if you were going to do this, you'd want to do it right. So I think yeah, we, think we right definitely way, don't want to bungle this. Let's make, yeah, that's absolutely the case. Uh, so and then, just as an aside, if I might, just for a small question, and then we can re return to the scope of what we're doing. Mike, is this something that, that 
once you get people spun up on it, that if we wanted to do things that were more like in the, in the size of uh, 55 gallons, uh, instead of buying poly drums or twice that size or something that's sort of the size, the volume you get out of an IBC tote that we could scale back down and people go, yeah, we, we've done it. We know how to make those. Yeah. I, I mean, honestly, usually I use these for, for the larger tanks. Yeah. Um, I know that uh, water for people uses ferro cement quite a bit for even tanks for like a rainwater catchment yep. off of a yep. roof. So it might be like a thousand or, or 2000 liter okay. type of tanks. But, um, Honestly, usually we're, we're using them more on like the 25,000. Understood. Okay. I and mean, that's just a diversion I just wanted to ask because I have a separate application where that might be appropriate. Or we actually mm -hmm. have it as a follow-on project for ours of augmenting our, our well water supply system with sure. rainwater catchment. So we'll be coming to that uh, later on down the road after we get through this project. Mm -hmm. Thanks. You yeah. Know, and, you notice here, I have just assumed two weeks of the uh, uh, expert mason. I, I think uh you said two to three weeks uh, you know i assume that he could eventually teaches the local mason and then he he can leave uh, so uh, that that was part of my assumption yeah yeah i, I mean it, i'd say two to three weeks so if you wanted to be conservative you could bump that up to 15 days yeah yeah and mike you said the uh the mason could travel over there uh to to from guatemala yeah so it's uh you know, Central America has the ability to, you can, you can work, you can, as long as you've got a country ID card, you can travel and work, you get a work, per, automatic work permit to go into a neighboring country. That's fantastic. Um, Mike, maybe you, you would be the best to kind of do a quick description of the ferro cement tanks. tanks. I've seen some description in this field guide, which suggests like wrapping a flexible pipe around and make it as a temporary form. But then I've heard other ones you just, set up a mechanical, I mean, a metal frame, chicken wire type frame, and you slather stuff on like plaster. So do you have some experience on which way to go? Yeah, I think if you read like the Red R Disaster Field Guide, they use like a sheet of, um, of lamina on the, the roofing material as kind of a form. But usually our experience has been is that we take uh, Usually it's not the chicken wire, it's the uh, half inch by half inch uh, grid. Um, I think it's called wire board. mesh. Yeah, wire mesh, thank you. And we would put two layers of that, one on each side of the rebar that's, uh, that's there. That gives you a little space between that, gives you a little space for that, for that mortar to, uh, to kind of get pressed into. And that's what we would use to, uh, to apply it. Um, frankly, the the sides go up pretty well. The hard part in particular is the roof on the inside. That's where it takes a little bit more skill to be able to get the mortar at the right consistency so that it sticks and uh, doesn't fall down on your head. <laughs> it does take a while though, guys. Um, you know, for me, the, you know, maybe I'm jumping way ahead on your, on your matrix, but uh, for something that needs speed, so for example, right now to do a COVID-19 response at a hospital that I need to get some storage immediately, I would not select a, uh, a ferro cement tank. And then of course, I always like the poly tanks if I've got the need the flexibility to move them. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, Phil, you wanna flip to the trade study? I think we, I think we had enough discussion of these. Yeah, and just Mike, would you compare the making putting the the roof the ceiling on the ferro cement tanks is harder than even the CMU kind of um, ceiling? I know that those require special forms and it's a little challenging on those things as well. Yeah, I would because you know like with the CMU we can just go ahead and brace up the formwork from from uh, the bottom of the tank mm -hmm. and uh, pour the concrete just like you'd pour any kind of uh, slab. Uh, so it takes a little bit more skill to do the to do the roof on the on the ferro cement tank, so they're okay. they're a little bit uh, they're a little they're a little fussier. That makes sense. Thanks. Okay, uh, at the bottom of, of of each of these, I have a little discussion there to kind of explains a little bit you know, my reasoning for some of the numbers that I put in there. But rather than going through them, I I guess the things that we really ought to take a look at. I guess first is is what are the weighting factors? Uh, what what 
do people feel is is really most important here for uh, what we're doing in El Yanito? And uh, you know, I I Phil gave me some suggestions. I actually uh, modified them slightly for, uh, based on my own personal uh, opinions. And but uh, it would really be interesting to hear what other people say and what they think. Before we apply those weighting factors, could I just ask? This is maybe a naive question, but Mike, why 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 do you think of ferro cement when you think of tanks in this size range? Um, for a for a couple of reasons. One, um, a lot of times it's the uh, installation ease of installation. You know, if I've got to do a tank up on the side of the mountain with not good access, the it's pretty difficult to lug a poly tank up there, right? So so it's easier to to move the, the sand and the and the cement and the rebar mesh up there piecemeal and then do the construction. So access to the site is a, is a biggie. And then frankly, you know, I like the ferro cement because they're, they last longer than the poly tanks. And I just as soon pay the local masons to, uh, to build them rather than pay rotoplast to pay do them. So it's kind of, uh, if you will, local community support. And versus the CMU, do you have a do you have a take on that? Because I know you and and uh, and Javier were there when they were built in in uh, Honduras. Yeah, I think I, I mean the CMU and the ferro cement for me, it's um, the, I don't I think the CMU is just as durable. I think you've got the life expectancy rated the same, and I I would agree with that. Uh, the initial cost is looks like you've got pretty much a push. They're about the same. Um, maintenance, honestly, I think they're about exactly the same, like you've got shown. Uh, basically, to repair both of them, you go inside the tank and just put another uh, layer of mescla wherever it's leaking. And then the installation time, I would agree with what you've got shown, that it's pretty much a, the same, uh, maybe a little bit, little bit faster with the CMU versus the ferro cement, and that would depend on the, the expertise. The nice thing about the ferro cement also would be is that it usually uses less formwork than let's say like the CMU, which does use a fair amount of wood, particularly to cast the, uh, the top. So that sounds really good. And so one thing that occurs to my mind, just as we did when we, uh, when we did our alternatives analysis, if we get this pulled together and it's close, but I would suggest one of the things we would want to do is work with, uh, with, with Luz Dania and Alcanza and the CAPS to really, you know, engage the, the community, engage the builders, and, and really make sure that their fingerprints are all over this. Because they may say, yeah, we'd like, if it's close, we'd like to learn this new ferro cement technology. Uh, or they might say, look, we know how to do these CMU tanks. Let's just do that. So, I mean, I really think we'll, we'll get it to the point where I think the next step after we make our, our trade study is, well, we might have a recommendation or perhaps should, or say it's so close that the only recommendation that's left is, you know, a view socialized by the community. So that, I know we got really good, uh, we, it was important for us on our alternatives analysis, and it's a requirement uh, for submittal that we have the community engagement there, but I think we would do the same thing here. And by now we've got a skilled mason and a, 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 and a helper, an assistant, and we've got other people. So, uh, and, and the skilled mason and others in the community are the same guys who built uh, uh, quite a few uh, dual vault CMU and Piedras Canteras uh, uh, vaults for the composting latrines. So we could, that's just a thought. Again, I'm jumping past getting, getting through this trade study and, and to the point where it sounds like to me from Mike's perspective that both the, 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 the non-plastic options are more durable and that there's not an awful lot of difference in cost, et cetera, that the, the ferro cement's trickier to do, um, but uses less form work. So we can figure out all the weighting, but I'm just saying if we get to where these are close, then the next step I would say is we really socialize it with the community and see what they prefer to do. If I could take just a second, just, I mean, Daniel hasn't seen trade studies before, just to explain a little bit about what this table is. Larry did a really nice job. So we have a weighting factor. In an ideal world, you kind of agree on the weighting factors beforehand. In, an, in the real world, you have a take a first stab at it, and then you tweak it at a review process like we're doing now. And then this, 
we uh, scoring is try to be as objective as possible and, and consistently apply a scoring toward each one of these things. And you multiply the score times a weighting factor to get the weighted score. And then when you look through all the different parameters, you just sort of add them up. And yeah, right now, if you look at this thing, it tells you the CMUs is the favored approach. It has a little bit higher score. But as like Pat said, let's talk about it stuff. I think Mike is saying this waiting factor for installation time that may be weighting it too heavy if this thing is gonna be out there for 20 years or so. So what if it takes a few extra weeks? So it might make sense to drop this down quite a bit. And maybe we can make a few arguments about, so oh, I don't know, installation issues. Is it really that much harder to do the ferro cement tanks than the CMU? Maybe that's a little bit too low of a score, for example. But these are the kind of stuff that we kind of tweak out now that we're talking our way through it. And as a first blush, it does show, as Pat says, that the poly tanks is a significant enough lower than the other ones that's probably something that we're going to be eliminating. But um, Larry, I'll turn it back to you if you want to go talk through some more of this. Yeah, I don't, and like Phil says, it probably would have been good to have the weighting factors defined before I did this. Uh, so I guess we're, I think it's good to visit in retrospect because uh, as to what people's views are, um, I did. But the yeah, point I, is, Larry, you made a wonderful framework for us to be able to hold up and, and, and discuss and do just what we're talking about. It's kind of like when you make a plan, you're not going to execute the plan necessarily, but the plan informs how you're going to talk about it and work through it and all the rest of it. And so I really, I, I couldn't thank you enough for having gotten this knocked out real quick. So. So, um, you know, what do you guys think are, are the most important uh, features? I mean, I should, I should expect life and initial cost is the two highest uh, weighting factors there. Um, yeah, and, and, that's, and I put them at actually three times what the installation issues are or the maintenance issues, but I don't know if, if that's what people really feel like. This, some of the discussion I just heard sounds like maybe that's not a, a what we would come up with as a consensus. Well, I, after hearing Mike and others, I would say suggest at first dropping the waiting for the installation time down to no more than 15%, maybe 10% even, because we're looking at something for the long run, a few extra weeks is kind of minor in when you look at the big picture. And another thing, um, so, so Mike, since we installed the tanks, um, we had a few kind of fissures uh, that uh, a few leaks uh, at, at the beginning. And then um, what happened was kind of like the, the cement particles as it was uh, seeping through uh, kind of filled in the cracks and, and it completely sealed um, the tank. So there's no leaks whatsoever in it, um, which was kind of, kind of cool. It kind of calcified uh, the cracks um, and, and they weren't, you know, they weren't much. Yeah, and that, that happens quite a bit, honestly, that uh, for those minor cracks, they'll kind of self-seal as, uh, as you get that effervescence that, that comes through. And if they're more significant, you know, they're not that difficult to, to deal with because like, you can just put some, some mortar on the inside and, of course, the hydrostatic pressure just pushes it up against the, the wall. So they're generally not that difficult to maintain in the big picture. Yeah, I thought that was pretty cool. Um, and, and so the other thing is we do have earthquakes, right? In Central America, sometimes during eruptions and stuff like that. Or, mm -hmm. So how, do you know anything about uh, ferro cement, like how they hold up with, uh, with uh, like earthquakes and stuff like that? I think I'm yeah, gonna actually, to Mike. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so that one actually came up um, because uh, one of the municipalities wanted to see a full seismic analysis on it. So as long as you've got the height of the tank is lower, we used a two, two meter height on the uh, ferro cement tank. Um, it checked out fine for seismic. Okay. How thick are the walls of the ferro cement tank? Um, the thickness on the walls usually are about two and a half inches thick. So you keep applying layers until you get two and a half inches thick. I will say it seems to me like it's a very cool technology to have in developing countries. I mean, you know, I, I, what I'm hearing is that it's also is kind of a bit of an art to, to be able to build them well. But it, it seems like it's, when you think about that, being able to have that kind of a, uh, a structure with 
a two and a half inch, less than three inch kind of a wall and have it perform, that seems kind of like it's thrifty, thrifty engineered structure. Well, where it, where it actually, where your scores would, would start to differentiate a little bit more is when you get to the larger size tanks. So let's say like a 50, 75 or a hundred um, cubic meter tank, because that hoop strength that you get out of a circular tank starts to outperform the square tanks wow. that you get on the CMU. Yeah. So exactly. you'll start to see those, you'll, you'll see some more efficiencies in the ferro cement on a little bit larger <laughs> structure. Got it. Um, and then uh, during the installation um, of the ferro cement, so I'm assuming it takes a couple of weeks to put the foundation down and let it cure, you're gonna have a pretty heavy weight on there. And then as you put this layer upon layer on here, do you have to do it pretty continuously? You can't like take a week off or something because you don't you want bonding between layers of the cement that you put on? Or is there any issues with that? You know, you wanna keep advancing the work. I think that's, that's a good point, Phil. But uh, we've never, you know, if, if we had to take off, you know, a weekend or even a week because maybe it was Holy Week or something like that, that's never caused any kind of, of issues. I've never had a situation where we try to take off like two months or something like that. I think then you'd probably have to need to go back in there and, and do a real good job of cleaning the surface. But I think it, uh, I think generally the work will progress. Uh, Mike, just a clarification. Uh Phil said you build the pad first, then you put the tank on it. The, the design information I saw looked like you build the floor as part of the tank. That it's all, it's all one piece of steel structure. Is that correct? Well, it depends. There's a couple of different designs out there. There's, a, I think it's the UNHCR design is more than what you're um, talking about, Larry, where it's where it's uh, one structure. Um, the one that uh, we've typically used, which frankly we stole from uh, Agua Para La Salud. And um, that's more of what Phil's talking about where we would bore for the, uh, for the slab, just like you would for the, the CMU, obviously have the rebar sticking up and then just splice up on top of that. Both of them, we built both of them and they, they both seem to perform pretty well. Which Mike, would you comment on kind of the stock of, of built ones, like how much experience do we as EWB and you and your team in Guatemala and elsewhere have with these tanks? Yeah, so I think the first one that we built would go back, see that would be Nueva Providencia, so that would have been maybe nine or 10 years ago, Pat. Okay. But, uh, but I know that, you know, the water for people tanks that they built, um, some of those are, well, Lynn Roberts has been down there almost 40 years. So, and so from a longevity standpoint, that's pretty good. Got it. And so many, many of these, I mean, it's not just a few that have been built. There've been quite a few. Yeah, I don't, I, I'm certainly not hundreds, but I would say, you know, maybe somewhere around, I don't know, let's call it 40 or something like that. Yeah, okay. So That's I like helpful. to propose maybe changing this weighting factor. It looks like you've got the spreadsheet is live here, right, Larry? So if I change the numbers, it should ripple yeah, yeah. through? Yeah, I think, I think I sent you the, the native file. So if I change the weighting factor to 15% for installation time and then bumped it up the life to 35%, Kind of show we want stuff to last longer. The other one is in terms of the installation issues. I'm not convinced that it's that much less. Maybe this is a five as opposed to a two for the ferro cement. And so with those changes, these things are almost a wash between the two of them. I I think you know from my perspective, and I don't know that much about you know, your, your project site, and whether what's really key, but I think Pat's very, uh, you know, is on the right track in the sense that you're so close here that, that you really just probably need to approach the community and see what they're comfortable with. Mm -hmm. I don't think, I think the good news here, guys, is, is you can't make a bad decision. You've got two really <laughs> good choices. Oh, super. This is really great. Uh, 
you know, what I would suggest then, I don't know how much more we want to chat about this together. I've just got to thank you, Mike, uh, for joining the call and weighing in here. I really appreciate it. And Daniel, I'm glad you could make this call. Uh, I've been recording it so we can share it uh, if we feel like it, uh, not to everybody, but to our project team or uh, to Mike if he thought it was helpful. Uh, but uh, this has been super helpful from my perspective. And Larry, I just want to say again, you gave us a framework for being able to come in here and, and work through it that will just, this will be just right. You know, when we take this to the community and say, you know, we've got it, this is our take on this. What do you think? Uh, those of us who've been there, this site, uh, the tank location is a bit of a hike up a hill. Uh, there is a back way to it. So you could, you could envision being able to horse up plastic tanks up there, but it'd be uh, nice if, if we dismiss them anyway, then, then uh, being able to uh, get them up there just uh, in either one of these options would be fine. I would point out that uh, over on the backside of Peña La Brada, um, there is a community, is it called Alt, Alba or what is it, Phil, when we walked over there, where the only access is basically uh, carabiners on mules or horses. <laughs> and so, uh, it's something that at the appropriate time, if they decide, and, and Alcanza works that side of the, 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 the they, need, they need sanitation, for example, so they're candidates for composting latrines. Um, Adelaida is a volunteer, I forget what they call them, they're not Alcanza staff, but they're Alcanza community facilitators who are kind of volunteers. She's also the treasurer of our CAPS. She's also been the treasurer of the composting toilet cohort. So she's, she's a mover and shaker in town and she's been up there trying to, on the other side of Peña La Brada to do, do community organizing and community uh, facilitation for, for increasing capacity. So this might be a, a preferred technology uh, in terms of being able, you know, whether you're transporting CMUs and, and, and concrete or, and form work or just, uh, just concrete, I mean, just, just bags of cement and other materials, I don't know whether they can, whether they can get the other uh, aggregate and sand and stuff on the other side of the mountain or not, but it might have benefit over in that nearby community. And then there, there are like 15 total communities around uh, Santa Lucia that we were, we had an opportunity when, when we were wrapping up, Alcantara took us around those. So there are a number of adjacent communities where this might be helpful. Um, we have, uh, Mike, we have one community, uh, El Coyote, I think, where they lost their well. And so right now they have a, uh, Alcance helped them, the 25 or so families, to get them IBC totes. And, mm -hmm. uh, and they worked a deal with uh, the mayor's office to uh, get uh, a, a water company to bring out tanker trucks. And so they bring out tanker trucks and fill those, those IBC totes. Um, they're trying to get a rainwater catchment project going there, but you know the IBC totes are there. They are what they are. But there, there might be an example where you'd want uh, one of these kind of tanks if it turned out it was handy and people knew how to build them to make uh, more durable uh, rainwater catchment uh, things in the typical household rainwater catchment size. So those are a few things that I see looking ahead. What else do we need to do here together, you guys? I think um, this is great. I'll uh, send this revised version out. I'll highlight the changes that I made in it. And our conclusion is that either the CMU or the ferro cement tanks are both viable approaches and better than the poly tanks. And our next step would be meeting with the community uh, to discuss which makes the most sense for them and taking into account other future tanks in the neighboring communities as well. Just one caution from my side is those cost estimates, those are, were rough for use in a trade study. If when you finally make the selection as to which one, I think somebody ought to go through and maybe do it in a little more detail. Good point. Okay. Daniel, did you have any questions? You are our one UC Berkeley student representative and that's one of the things we've been excited about in this, in this project is to have you guys partnering with us. Do you have any other thoughts or observations? I think you guys covered it all pretty much. I think I have a pretty good understanding of how it works. I've seen alternative analysis matrices before and they look, this looks like a really good one. It's well thought out. It looks like a pretty good balance system. I think you guys did a good job, yeah. Great, thanks. Well, yeah, if, you, uh, if it's something that you want to go over or have, if you wanted to have uh, Phil or somebody, one of us come and present, uh, if we ever get to do those in the near term, 
<laughs> we could be social. We could do a Zoom call with more of your chapter. We won't be coming up there and <laughs> shaking hands. That's that's for sure. All righty. Um, going once, going twice. I guess we're good. All righty. All right, sounds good, guys. Okay. Thank you so much, Mike, for joining us. Thank you all. Yeah, and Excellent. I love the beard, Javier. <laughs> <laughs> I, yeah, I, I noticed his uh, LinkedIn profile looks a little different. <laughs> it's a I got to tell you, Mike, when I when I made my big excursion after Nicaragua, I went I, to uh, uh, to Panama and then to Honduras uh, before I got to Guatemala on my way back oh, to Belize. Well. And and uh, Javier said, "Oh, in Honduras, you got to go check out the Honduras Brewing Company." So <laughs> I asked my hotel. Uh, can I safely go do that? And the one gal at the concierge uh, didn't know uh, where it was, but the others who were there, they were shooting a thing because she was this lovely young employee of the month that was going to be featured on the site. And they all said, oh, piece of cake. It's like three minutes away. It's all on right in here in this downtown hotel area. You can safely go over there. It's fine. <laughs> so. Yeah. yeah. I didn't get a chance to take um, uh, Mike over there because uh, uh, obviously he was mostly working most of the time and and, uh, and we only had him for a short uh period of time but man like over there in the uh, in the uh, what's the city name of the city called uh, uh, up there that you visited in Te oh, Te Te that uh -huh. brewery, yeah. that brewing company is, is amazing there they, they they've really done uh, an awesome job kind of doing the same beer culture that we have here you know just right there for for Honduras it's really that's cool. a fun thing and I the other thing I didn't appreciate I mean I kind of felt like I was going to be an anxious traveler and I wasn't going to get outside my rotary bubble and uh uh, past district governor hosted me and took me all around there. She stayed at our house when she was up here a few years ago, Carmen Vieta. Uh, and uh, I for, I didn't realize how drop dead gorgeous that city and the surrounding mountainous terrain is. It's mm. just wonderful, it's a beautiful place. And this young young woman, Rotarian, about the age of my daughter, a couple years younger, got tasked to take me to the airport. And so she WhatsApp me and said, would you like me to take you around before we go right to the airport? I said, sure. So she took me to this beautiful sightseeing thing, wonderful little towns that, uh, you know, that they like to go up to to get out uh, up and, and go around. And so we had a wonderful time. And uh, she's still now WhatsApp me with, with rotary meetings, and she's got a boatload of rotary friends. So she's a real gung-ho Rotarian. So. All right, you guys. On that note, anybody else have anything they want to share? Mike, do you want to just give us a, a, just a few moments update on, on uh, COVID-19 tactical response stuff that you're working on? I thought the things that you briefly shared with me about what was going on in Guatemala were very cool. Everything from the biomed stuff. I, again, I'm going to be sensitive to people's time. but Yeah, I can just give you a quick, uh, quick update. So this is a little bit different than, um, you know, Bruce and, and Tom or Becky have got their, their group that they're working on. But we had, uh, actually, it's a really nice story, um, Pat, from a rotary standpoint. It's really put together the same team that did the response to the uh, Volcano Fuego response. So it's, uh, in, in essence, what happened is rotary uh, attracts a considerable amount of funding there from local businesses, the banks, cement company, um, uh, Tigo, the, the cell phone company, et cetera. So during uh, Fuego, I think they raised about two and a half million dollars, um, wow. primarily from local businesses, and were able to do a pretty significant response. And because they are what I'll call a major player, then they get they were uh, working directly with the uh, the response team, which was led by the Army Corps of Engineers of Guatemala. Um, so the Army basically led the response. Conrad, which is their equivalent of FEMA, um, was supporting that. And that's really the same thing that's happening now with COVID. And so the nice thing is all those relationships were established, Rotary, um, Army Corps of Engineers, et cetera. And so really the response that we're doing there is kind of twofold. One is we're working with the hospitals to get them COVID ready. Um, and what that really means is increasing the water supply, increasing water storage, adding toilets and adding uh, hand washing stations. And then the second part that we heard loud and clear from the hospitals is their lack of uh, PPE for the uh, doctors. And uh, little be known to me, we've got actually a pretty good group of biomedical engineers within Engineers Without Borders, a lot of expertise there. And so we were able to harness that and um, work with uh, local industries so that they could pivot from whatever they were manufacturing to manufacturing PPE for the local hospitals. 
And so that's been, um, been uh, kind of our focus um, down in Guatemala. This week we delivered 80,000 pieces of PPE to the hospitals. And wow. um, yeah, it's been pretty cool. That is very cool. Well, thank you so much for sharing that with us. And, and uh, uh, we, you know, we, we, some of our people, Phil and others, are, are looking at ways to maybe connect with Bruce uh, when he was looking for talent. So this just is all a part of the picture uh, uh, that is uh, really encouraging about the other ways that EWB works and how it partners with Rotary. I have one other question for you. Uh, why, aren't, why aren't Rotary and EWB uh, on the Partners in Health uh, list of, of sponsors. This is Paul Farmer's outfit. You know, Dr. Paul Farmer from Haiti founded this thing. Is there something there that, is there some reason we're not, or is it just, it just hasn't ever gotten latched up? I think it's just, I, I can't speak from a rotary standpoint, actually, Pat. So, so I don't know what the situation is there. I know from EWB, we did work uh, for Partners in Health for, as a service corps during the Ebola crisis. But just have never um, had a had the opportunity or the reason, I guess, to to have additional projects with them. So um, yeah, I mean, it's I, I don't think there's any issues there. Good. Okay. I, I asked. I wondered because I noticed that the the governor of Massachusetts has engaged them to do contact tracing at scale in Massachusetts. So we're we're looking at a a, a COVID response uh, reversed one, if you will, in our area four here and. One of the things to try and make it sustainable, in addition to just delivering PPE, which won't cut it, got to have that sustainable overarching thing is I'm thinking if we can get contact tracing going, and they may not be the answer. California Governor Newsom may already have a, a plan for how he's going to do that. But, uh, you know, when I, when I tried to reach partners in health, uh, you can email their info. Of course, they're really good. They send you an automated reply that tells you a little bit about the organization with a big donate button on it. But if you do, then you get your, their newsletters. And I got a newsletter that had a link to their app, which right now you could sign up to be a be hired to be a contact tracer in Massachusetts. And down wow. at the bottom, you you can see who made the app and you click on that and they're an, an HR company in the cloud who uh, is in the business of hiring people. I emailed them and said, could we use this for volunteer engagement? We're not hiring them, but if we want to get Rotarians and citizen volunteers to do contact tracing, wrote back and said, sure, yeah, we can easily do that. We got a one day training course that's been approved by CDC and, uh, and Massachusetts. You'd have to check in California and you need phone banking, which you need to get from us or they got it from Salesforce or something. But so I'm exploring mm -hmm. that as well. But I would, I could just see a whole raft of EWB folks and Rotarians and citizens doing contract contact tracing in California if we could pull this off. So at what, any rate, what I think that's what's the uh, what's the uh, contract tracing that you're talking about? Uh, for COVID for COVID infections, one of the things since we don't have um, don't have vaccinations and we don't have good therapies for it, if you can figure out how to find out, it's an old epidemiological kind of a control strategy, public health strategy, whereas if you find somebody who's infected and then you see who's been close to them and in contact with them uh -huh. through an interviewing process, it's, and it's been applied to everything from AIDS to other sexually transmitted diseases to anything that's infectious. Uh, and now it's uh, Google and app and Apple are trying to build it into their phones with some fancy dancy things that does cryptograph, you know, encrypted codes that, that run automatically. And then if anybody gets within six feet of you for so long and you, and you come up infected, maybe you don't want trolls saying, oh, I'm infected just to rattle the system. But if a doctor verifies you're infected, then it will go back and, and cycle through and look for all those block, those codes that of people that were exposed to you, notify them and so forth. But that'll keep the app builders busy for a while. I think Partners in Health does it the old way with phone banking. Yeah. So on that, I digressed completely here. I, <laughs> I, um, I did, Mike, I don't know if, is Engineers Without Borders doing anything else uh, for COVID? Because um, when I talked to the Guatemala uh, uh, or the Nicaragua team, uh, the actual EWB office, I was talking to Evelyn, uh, Pat, um, and, and uh, she was telling me that, that they're doing some type of uh, simple hand washing stations where they use a pedal and, uh, you know, has a like portable water and, and soap, um, just simple things like that, that the contactless uh, hand washing stations throughout like small communities. That could yeah, help. yeah, yeah, Mike, Mike joined us on a call with uh, some, some other folks that, that Bruce Neiman and Sam Bird and Larry Bentley and uh, others were on where they were looking at these hand washing options. I think basically oh. for the Uganda office that had, had triggered that, that thing, but it'd probably be more applicable. I mean, it'd be applicable anywhere, but that's, I think, what triggered it. And uh, 
So there are a variety of initiatives that are being run at. Some of them are tactical, some of them are these. So Mike, you, you are much closer to it. You, you are, you, you, maybe you can comment further, but uh, at least some of us were exposed to a little bit of that. And, and uh, uh, Bruce was looking for additional talent as well that he might engage. And I've suggested a few people from the SFP chapter that might be involved. Yeah, I think, and I might be wrong on this, but as far as I'm aware, I mean, I know that there's been a manual that's put together for like hand washing stations that I think, but I, I think there hasn't been, I think the only place that we're actually implementing something is in, uh, in Guatemala. And that's basically preparing hospitals for the, the, the COVID response. Uh, yeah, so we, you know, like today, you know, just lucked out, we repaired two wells, um, submersible pump wells that were having problems, installing additional uh, storage, uh, installing um, larger waiting rooms. So we've got uh, some triage areas because we want to have separate entrances, of course, for COVID and non-COVID people coming into a hospital. Uh, one interesting thing is that up in, um, with the border with Mexico, they're having a problem because the guys that are coming across from uh, Mexico, they uh, basically are being treated like refugees, so they need to have a, a, a refugee camp. So you'll like this, Pat, we were able to, uh, we had a bunch of leftover um, shelter box tents. Oh, so, uh, yeah. <laughs> so we uh, went up there and took over one of the stadiums and set up a whole bunch of shelter box uh, tents Great. for uh, for the folks there that are basically in quarantine up there waiting for their 14 days. Wow. You know, and that thing, just one other interesting technology I stumbled into, uh, there was an article in the Cron, San Francisco Chronicle a couple of days about infrared uh, sensing and its applicability. And FLUR has been in this field for a long time, but there's a Santa Barbara based newcomer called Seek Thermal, S-E-E-K. Mm. And they offer a couple of product lines. One is a, a set of things that are basically just for um, qualitative information about hot things. And they're a camera that plugs into your phone and they range from 250 to 500 bucks. But I mean, one of the things it's like for hunters, if you want a night hunt, you can see your deer or you can see your, you know, your boar or whatever. But then they, they have now got what is called a seek scan and it's a, uh, it's a $2,000 package that, that uh, actually has one of their devices in a standalone box uh, as well as a calibrated heat source and you, you just come into a, a kind of a vegetable entry area and you tape it off and set it up on a tripod and people step into the zone and with the calibrated heat source, this thing now gives you a temperature, you, you set a go, no go, and you screen people on the fly as to whether they have an acceptable temperature or they need to be cued for further uh, inspection and whatnot. And so uh, it, uh, the one healthcare provider in our, uh, in our valley that we work with a lot called Access Community Health did not think that was useful for them, but it may be in this global grant we're starting to put, to, to put together that there may be other contexts, whether it's schools or businesses or whatever, where people, you want to have people come back to work. And so you want to at least make sure they're not hot. So yeah. it's, it's too you know, hot. Yeah, and, and Javier, kind of back to your question about uh, Nicaragua, you know, what I've seen is every country kind of comes to its own realization at some point about how serious the, uh, the virus really is. And so, and that can change like that, you know, in a matter of a couple of days, people are, are in, a, in, the, in the mindset of, well, you know, we think the virus is gonna pass over us and uh, we're gonna be okay. And then all of a sudden they hit the panic button, right? I just, that happened here like two days ago in Ghana. So, you know, Nicaragua right now is still in the, in the mindset of, they're hoping that the virus is just going to pass over them, and I, I pray that that is going to be the case. So the government really is, uh, is saying no big deal here. The Ministry of Health is no big deal. So I'm talking to Elizabeth and, and the team down there. I mean, I think they're ready to engage, but like I've told them, I mean, you you know, we learned a long time ago, you can't help anybody who doesn't want to be helped, right? Yeah. Yeah. So we kind of have to wait for the Ministry of Health to say, hey, we really need some assistance, and then I think we'll be be ready to engage. But, um, and, and I think, you know, at some point the, that will happen, but you just have to kind of be patient. Yeah. yeah. Meanwhile, our partners are using good practices. Both the Alcanza team and the country office are working from home and social distancing. And, uh, you know, their, uh, the, the feedback from Luz from Alcanza is that the work is continuing in El Anito, but they're quite aware of, of social distancing and, and so forth, but they're not, it's not like they're dead in the water. So, yeah. Well, it's, 
I mean, we're, we are hearing some reports, um, you know, uh, Venezuela, uh, the, um, down in Brazil. Um, actually, today I just got a report from a friend in uh, Bolivia where the healthcare systems are dangerously close to collapsing. Uh, the, wow. as, the, uh, as the virus has gotten more aggressive and they've seen more patients, the healthcare workers have, uh, have basically not shown up. They don't want to show up if they don't have water and they don't have PPE. So they're not going to put their lives at risk. And of course, as soon as the doctors and nurses don't show up, the, the word is out on the street that the, to the patients that you just got to kind of stay home and, and hope for the best. So that's when the, the healthcare system, you know, basically completely collapses. So those are the things that we're trying to, to track and, and see if maybe we can stay in front of, um, because once that happens, it's going to be really hard to kind of put it back together again. Mm -hmm. hey, Mike, Thank you. Mike I, I just uh, wanted to add, I saw a news clip the other day. It's just some, a thought. I don't know if this really works. But the, at one place, the, because of having issues with the PPE, uh, they came up with a system where they had a fogger in an enclosed chamber, and they would do sanitizing. Uh, uh, I think the cell is operating that, Larry, as well. I mean, I saw examples of uh, the hydrogen peroxide vaporization, uh, essentially sanitizing chambers. Uh, Mike may have an additional insight on it, too, but I saw that come up, too. Yeah, yeah, yeah you know, it, uh, it seems like it's a possible approach, I mean. Yeah, I, I think there's, there's two, two very simple uh, strategies that we've been using in the developing world. One is um, for like uh, N95 masks, those, as long as you've got uh, 70 degree temperature for 30 minutes in a humid and humid heat. So basically that's as simple as having a dedicated oven that's set at uh, 70 degrees C and uh, for 30 minutes with a pan of water in the bottom and you can decontaminate in, uh, in 30 minutes. Of course, the much simpler thing is, is we know the virus will deteriorate in, in three days. So you can just, if you have four um, pieces of PPE, you can just put them, uh, put them in a paper bag, not a plastic bag, but a paper bag, and let them sit for three days. And then you just basically rotate those um, with the same person. And, uh, and that's another way to, to basically recycle um, and reuse that PPE. Yeah, that's pretty good. neat. All right. All right, guys, got to run. So much. I know it's getting late okay. for you, Mike. Appreciate it. Get some rest. Thanks, guys. All right. Nice Bye. Bye. Nice Thanks. Bye. Bye.